John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to Episode 9, titled History is Very Personal, featuring the story of Christine Smith, a librarian at Spalding High School in Barrie. In the previous episode, we heard the story of Paul, a former academic advisor who fully dedicated himself to his students and co-workers, whoever they were, wherever they were. In this episode, we will hear the story of a high school librarian named Christine, whose mind was enlivened by a humanities course she took while pursuing a bachelor's in education as a single working mother. Ever since, she made it her life's mission to liberate others' minds by teaching hidden histories, and in particular, women's history and Native American history. For her, these histories are very personal. She is a woman with Abenaki ancestry. The Abenaki are the first peoples of Vermont. The name Abenaki means people of Dawnland. The Abenaki have been here long before the French and British colonizers and long, long before the mostly European immigrants who came to work in Barry's granite industry during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Archaeological records demonstrate that the Abenaki have been in Vermont for at least 10,000 years. Vermont is Dawnland. Vermont is the land of the Abenaki, who still live here and still fight to protect their land and communities. In fact, the Abenaki were the original granite carvers in Vermont. They were the first to recognize granite's unique properties, which are its durability and ability to hold fine edges. Outcraps of granite were available to them, making it easy to break off pieces for all kinds of toolmaking. From these outcrops, the Abenaki made motors and pedestals for grinding corn, berries, and nuts, as well as multi-purpose tools, such as hammers and mauls. Ironically, European colonizers viewed these outcrops as a nuisance when they arrived in Vermont, because they got in the way of their farming. Little did they know that those pesky granite outcrops would become very valuable one day. Then, when the colonizers came, everything changed. Before they came, Christine's Abenaki ancestors had harmonious relationships to each other and the land. They extended their peaceful way of being to the colonizers. And there was a brief period of relative peace, at first. The Abenaki and the British colonizers coexisted and traded with one another. The British wanted furs to satisfy an insatiable European market. They wanted beaver pelts, in particular. But the British weren't good trappers or hunters, so they relied on the expert hunting of the Abenaki and other indigenous groups. The demand for beaver pelts and furs became so great that eventually the Abenaki and other Native Americans found themselves trapped in the web of a growing capitalist world market. As the Abenaki spent more and more time supplying Europeans' ceaseless thirst for furs, they spent less and less time on their traditional hunting and farming practices, which had sustained both themselves and the land for thousands of years. At the same time, the numbers of colonizers were growing exponentially, which led to further encroachment on Abenaki lands. Colonizers began to violently seize Abenaki land and commit acts of war and genocide. With less and less land, it became harder for the Abenaki to continue their harmonious way of life. They had to rely more and more on trade with Europe and its violent economic system of capitalism. Ironically, most of the European settlers were gradually dispossessed of the very lands they had stolen. 
wealthy elite settlers expanded capitalist production and relations, carried on the backs of poor whites, blacks, indigenous peoples, and even independent yeoman farmers. In short, it was a class conflict in the form of taxes, land speculations, and wars. Ultimately, independent yeoman farmers were reduced to tenant farmers and wage slaves, paving the way for capitalist agriculture and industrial production in the United States. This is only a very cursory history. And, as Christine came to learn, understanding hidden and marginalized histories is important because it does, indeed, repeat itself. Maybe not in a literal, derivative way, but what I have learned from that common refrain is that class struggle and the struggles of all the oppressed continue to play themselves out. These patterns of systemic oppression affect us personally, as Christine's story makes clear. However, the working class in all of its diversity has the power to dismantle these oppressive systems and change the course of history. Christine is part of that change. In 2017, I recorded Christine's oral history. Her story will be performed by S.B. Sobel. I'm a true Vermonter. There's not many of us left. I'm a multi-generational Vermonter, at least probably three generations. I lived down in New Haven, and I went to high school at Mount Abraham Union High School. I had an okay education, I would say. I graduated in 1980, so the expectation was that women would stay home and get married. My family was not highly educated. My dad and mom both went through high school, so there was no expectation that we would go to college. However, when I was 18, I was like, maybe I do want to go. I did one year at Champlain College in Burlington, and that didn't work out well because I was tracked in high school. I didn't get the college track, so I really wasn't prepared for college. Then I just went into retail. I worked at a couple women's clothing stores. I worked at a pizza joint, and then I got really sick of that. In my late 20s, I went down to the Basin Harbor Club in Virgennes, and I worked down there as a bartender waitress. Then I got pregnant with my son. I realized that I needed a real job, and so I started to go back to school. When you come from a small town in Vermont, I think there's this, not stereotype, but there's this thing that you're just going to be a working-class person your whole life, and I am. I am a working-class person. My parents didn't go to college, so there really wasn't any expectation that I would go to school. When I wanted to go to school, my parents couldn't afford to help me pay for school, so I had to take out my own loan. It was $2,000, but at that time, it was a lot of money. But interestingly enough, two years later, my brother, who's two years younger, went to college, and guess what? He got money from my parents to go to school. So I always felt a little discriminated against by my folks, but I think it made me a stronger person, made me more determined to be self-sufficient. I was really fortunate because I was on assistance. I went through the Reach Up program. I had a really wonderful welfare worker who worked with me. She loved me. She was the sour old woman who had probably been doing the job forever. She really was kind of a pill. But her and I got along really well because I think she understood that I was trying to work hard to get out of my position. And I think people get burnt out on certain jobs. And she definitely was burnt out on her job. I think with me, it was a refreshing thing. She really worked hard with me to get me through school and to give me as many opportunities to do what I could. I got tuition assistance to the point where I had some books. I got daycare. That was the big one. They would have helped me with my car, but thank God I had my dad. He took care of the car. But they would have helped me with that, the transportation. The biggest thing was the health care. I was on WIC. I was on all of that. I had food stamps. And that was really hard, to be honest with you. That was not a good experience. Because at that time, you had the coupon books. 
I didn't go to the grocery store by my house. I went to a different one where I was anonymous, basically. And it's true what they say. People look in your cart and they try to tell you what you're buying. And not tell you, but you can see it in their eyes. I always made sure I didn't buy crappy food, but every once in a while, what's wrong with cookies or something like that? But it's like they were looking to see if I had steak or whatever, and it was like sometimes steak was cheaper than ground beef. That was very humiliating, I have to be honest with you. Food stamps is very humiliating, and it was a really hard situation. That's the one thing I wanted my kids to understand, because we talked a lot about economics, and especially during the Gilded Age, and how terrible it was to live during that time period, how there was no assistance, and how people who looked at the people who were impoverished as stupid, lazy, all those kinds of things. And I always felt that's what they thought of me, even though I was in school and I was doing really well, that I was this lazy mother taking government assistance. I told the kids, I worked from the time I was 15. I always worked. This is my government helping me. It's not like I'm going to live like this forever. It's there because I need it. I earned it. At college, I met a couple really great, amazing educators that really kind of made me feel very special and awoke me to my own intelligence and to women's history. One of my teachers at CCV in Burlington taught this amazing class. It was called Dimensions, which is kind of like a humanities course. He was such a great teacher. He really made me feel very special, like I had intelligence and that I mattered. That stuck with me because I realized I was 32 years old and it took until I was in my early 30s to kind of realize that I had a brain. I didn't like that. Also, at the same time, I took a women's history course. I was really angry because I realized that I didn't know anything about women's history, my own history as a woman. The first question she asked us on the first day was to name three American women from history. I named Susan B. Anthony because she was on the coin at the time. Then I named Betsy Ross because I remembered her from elementary school. I was really angry about that. I was like, how could that be possible? I've always loved history. When I was in high school, I would read a lot of historical novels and things like that. I guess that it's always been something I've gravitated towards. But I think it was those classes that I took at CCV that really changed my life. I always felt that it's important to understand who you are and where you come from and the connections to history because it does, indeed, repeat itself. I think we're coming into a time now where history is repeating itself through the Gilded Age. See, I always make history personal. History is personal for me, and I'm a very deep believer that history is very personal. When I was in college, I had to do this women's history project, and I had my grandmother's diaries. I looked in my grandmother's diary and my great-grandmother's diary, and they talked about going and voting. I went into the town records of New Haven, Vermont. I looked under 1920, and there's this huge list of women's names who took the Freeman's Oath in 1920 to vote. And my great-grandmother's name was right in the middle of it. I always try to find where I fit in. How do I fit? Where do I belong? Why am I the way I am? I also read a really great book about Mary Crow Dog, and I learned a lot about Native people. That kind of turned me on to that, too. I vowed when I graduated that I would teach a women's history course and a Native American history course. 
My grandmother and my great-grandmother and my aunt have all told us that we're Abenaki. Everybody has a native grandmother, supposedly. The last semester, you have to take all these other last-minute courses and things like that, and it was very stressful. I had to do my senior thesis. I had to write a paper. While I was ending that, I was looking for jobs, because April is the best time to start looking for jobs in the education field, because that's when the town meetings are done, they get their budgets, and the schools will start hiring. And so I put out, I think, seven resumes. I got three interviews, and I got the job at Spalding a week before I graduated from college. Being a new teacher was very stressful. For the first year, it was really hard. And then I ended up getting mono on my second year. So that was really detrimental to my health. I ended up getting chronic fatigue. The only reason why I got out of bed was because of my child, my job, and a dog at the time that had to be walked. I had that for a while. It went away, but then it's turned into fibromyalgia now. So I have that. So I've been suffering with that for probably about 15 years. It comes and goes. The hard part was the constant change of how we taught. A new mandate would come down and we'd be told, okay, you got to stop doing it this way and have to go this way. The best practice is this. That's the best practice, do this, do that. And it was, it was good. It made me a better teacher, but it was just a lot of work. It was hard. I don't like doing the same thing over and over again anyway. I'm not one of those people that makes a lesson and I teach it for 20 years. I changed it up all the time, but it just got to be hard. I think that was difficult. That and the politics, the constant kind of changing the way people looked at education and teachers, we're no longer put on a pedestal. And I'm not saying we should be, but we're also denigrated a lot. We're put down a lot, and we're kind of the cause of all the bad in the world because we're not doing our jobs. And there's so many wonderful teachers out there just doing the best they can, and it's just, that got really hard for me. So then I realized, you know what? I always told myself when it got to the point where I couldn't be the teacher I wanted to be, that it was time to go. I knew I had maybe two more years in me, and then I was not going to be teaching anymore. Luckily, I got the library position. Since I became a librarian, my free time has opened up a lot more. That's another thing I don't miss about teaching, is that dread of Sundays. Sundays were always a dread because I knew that I would spend the day correcting or lesson planning. So I literally had one day on Saturday. I always made sure Saturday was my day to do whatever I wanted to do. I just got to the point where I got resentful of my boyfriend because he would be sitting in front of the TV watching a movie or something while I was correcting for three or four hours or whatever. I do miss teaching history. History has been such a big part of my life for 20 years. I've always loved history, especially women's history, and I miss, I'm gonna start crying right now. I miss teaching that. I miss being with the kids because those connections you make with kids are so special. I had this one student whose mother was dying of breast cancer. I had her for my women's history and I had her for U.S. history, and the mother was not going to make it for graduation. She was not going to live. And so the school got together and had a graduation for her at her house so that her mother could see her graduate from high school. 
I was one of the only teachers that was there, that was probably the pinnacle of my teaching. Because to be in that room on such a special, special moment was just amazing. Another one is with another student whose mother passed away very young, and he had a lot of issues with school. He got in trouble all the time. But he was such a lovable kid, you couldn't help but like him. He took my women's history class because he thought it was going to be easy. We went to Hope Cemetery. One of my big things, the culminating things, was they had to do kind of an oral history project about a person in Barry. So I would take them up to Hope. We were walking around in Hope, just looking at some of the gravestones and the things like that. And then he got really quiet. He didn't say a word. He had his headphones on, and he just started walking. I was like, well, what's going on? And so we got back to school because we did our tour, and I took him to the side and I said, what's the matter? What's going on? He goes, I'm sorry, but I just couldn't stop thinking about my mom. It was like that moment where you realize, oh my God, I didn't even think about that connection. She was not buried in Hope Cemetery, but he just couldn't stop thinking about her. Then he looked at me and he goes, oh my God, that's the first time I've said the word mom in like two years. Because he never talked about her. It was just such an emotional thing. So it's not the history and teaching. It's those personal connections that you have with kids. That was the best part of my job. In the library, I think probably the thing I love the most is being creative and coming up with cool ideas for the library or coming up with a really awesome lesson plan that I know kids will really love. But at the end of the day, I feel exhausted, really tired. Because with fibromyalgia, you have a finite amount of energy. And I definitely use all that energy during the day dealing with kids. So when I get home, all my energy's gone. And I don't have a lot of patience. But I'll go home and I'll walk the dogs, or if I can't, my boyfriend will walk them. And then he has four girls. I have a son. He's 23 now, so he's out of the house. When I can, I try to stay home and rest. I will cook dinner and then get ready to go to bed. I hate the cleaning. It's like if I didn't have to ever pick up another dustpan or do another dish, my life would be wonderful. I find it to be drudgery. I find it to be never-ending. I don't find any satisfaction in vacuuming a rug. Some people get high off of vacuuming a rug. In reality, if I had all my needs met, if I became a winner of the lottery tomorrow, I would retire and just sleep and rest. That's my body telling me I need to do that. I just wish I could go on a beach and just be there for a couple weeks just because I just don't feel like I ever get that. Just to be disconnected from anything and just kind of relax. If I could, I would rest. But I know I'm the kind of person where that's great for about a month, and then I'd have to do something. I could never sit home. So if I could, I would probably travel. Being a single mother, I never had enough money to do the traveling I wanted. My boyfriend, he's traveled all over the place. He's gone to a lot of different places. That's always kind of been the bummer for me, is that I've always had to experience stuff through work. For example... I went to Montana to study Native American history and the westward movement of Vermonters. We had work to do. It was work. Any traveling I did wasn't for fun, and it was never relaxing. That's the fibro talking right now because I'm really tired. I'd have to do something. 
volunteer work or whatever, I need a reason to get up and get out of the house in the morning. I get bored. I will not do housework. I don't do housework. Sometimes I wish I had made more money when I was younger. I'm still living in my two-bedroom apartment. It's gotten to the point now, it's like we talked about getting an apartment or getting a bigger place. But we're so close to retirement, we don't want to do that. I've had my ups and downs with credit card debt because it's that revolving thing where you don't have the money, so you put it on your credit card, and then you have to pay your credit card. I've always had issues with trying to play catch-up, constantly fighting for financial stability. I have started to put money aside for retirement. I've been doing that for the past 15 years now. It's not a lot, but it's a little bit. We're not married. Bob and I are not married, so I look at myself as somebody who has to take care of myself no matter what, because you never know what's going to happen with him. I have my own savings account, but there's not a lot of money in there. I don't believe I would have the pay and benefits I have right now had it not been for the union. If you take a look at other states' teachers that don't have unions, like North Carolina, their pay is terrible. I feel like I get paid halfway decently. Do I wish I'd made more? Sure. But I had to go through school, both education-wise and time put in. I'm actually making a halfway decent living. New teachers coming in? They've got these huge college bills. The union is important. I have always been a member of the union. I believe in it 100%. I was one of their representatives. Not a representative at the state level, but within the school. I've helped rep people for a couple of years. Then politics, like I said, politics play a role in everything, in all of your life. I felt shut out a few times, and they did a couple of things that I didn't particularly care about. So I quit that and moved on, but I support it when I need to. If they have a call to arms, I'll do what I need to. I've gone on strike before. That was not a pleasant experience. That's terrible. That's a terrible experience not only because you're out of the classroom and you're away from your students, but it's the perception from the outside world that it's all your fault while you're out on the picket line. There's never this connection to the school board and their role in it. It's always the teacher that suffers. Spalding has a really long history here in Barrie. We're the longest-running high school in Vermont. Like I said, it's a working-class town, and they don't always pass the budgets on the first try. The school board is always trying to find ways to save money. They have to. But at the same time, the teachers have to make a living. I don't want to go on strike again, but it has to be done in order for you to make a living, too. You've got to survive like everybody else. I think that's what's really hard for people. If it were a job at a business, I don't think people would really care about the health care and stuff. But because the town or the city pay for your salary, they look at your benefits and they think that you're getting more than they're getting instead of saying, hey, everybody deserves this. was S.B. Sobel performing Christine's story. S.B. Sobel is a colleague of mine at Goddard College. Goddard College is a unique liberal arts college with a radically progressive pedagogy that is student-driven. Sobel works as both a faculty member and as an assessment of prior learning administrator, in which she helps students earn a college credit for non-academic experiences and training. She is also a passionate learner and fighter for social justice. 
In the studio, Sobel really identified with Christine's thirst for knowledge. Sobel found Christine's story about being tracked in school to be an excellent analogy for how social relations of power are reproduced in our society. Sobel also shared her own experience of being on welfare, as well as why and how we should make welfare programs more humane. And if you think about it, welfare is one of the few mechanisms we have for correcting the tracking in our society, which allocates wealth and power not based on right but on might. What I, what I liked about it is that it felt like a, a very full summary of a life. And I don't think that's easy to do. I think that we have, you know, we have such varied lives and so many experiences. There's a, a lovely humility and a great storytelling quality to it. I thought this is the story of a Vermont human with excellent citizenship. <laughs> I don't know. It was, it was lovely. It was lovely. Well, I come from a somewhat complicated background. <laughs> and... Uh, school was often a little bit of a refuge. So there were fun folks and there were teachers who were sort of interesting. And so it could be a place of play. And I had a teacher, well, I always, <laughs> I always liked teachers. But then in, uh, I think in elementary school, there were a few teachers. In junior high, Ted Picorni, I love you still. This was an art teacher. and. It was similar to what Christine described in terms of where she had the dimensions class. Well, it was just life-changing and life-saving. And so I knew I was smart. I, wasn't, I didn't particularly do well in school if I was bored and I'd get detention and that sort of thing. But if I was excited by something, I could soar. But there was this sense that college and all of that, I had no idea how you applied, how anything happened. Uh, and I honestly, teachers had to help me do applications. I had no idea how to get there. And it was a big puzzle. Um, but teachers were always a location of excitement and solace and support. Uh, oh, this is going to make me, this is going to make my eyes moist. Um, well, you know, my, my parents would be considered first generation. But I consider them a bridge generation, particularly my mother. They didn't really, they, <laughs> they were really living in two worlds. And so there was a move to be not too visible, you know, to succeed, but at a very modest level. That you could maybe be a kindergarten teacher, but a secretary was best. And if you were a secretary, you should probably work for the state. And it was amazing that I ended up working for the state. And the notion was that you are, you are to work hard. Nothing about collaboration. And there was a lot of divisiveness. And I felt like it actually, it was a reification. It was sort of a reliving of what they learned. That pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't necessarily pull anyone else up with you. You want to be sure that you represent your culture or community by being both quiet and very good at whatever you did, but not too good because you don't want to stand out, they could send you back to the old country, which did happen in one situation. And uh, my, my grandmother's brother was in New York. He was arriving on a boat, and she was taking a bus from Baltimore to go and pick him up. And she, there he was. He was on the dock, or close to anyway. And there were some folks who wouldn't let him off unless he gave them $15, which would have been an enormous amount of money. And they said, oh, we're going to make him get on that boat, and it's just going to take him right back. And she said, no, no, I can get the money. Now, her English was not grand, uh, and I don't know how she did this, but she said, I'll be, I'll be back. So she went back to Baltimore on the bus got $15, who knows how or where, and got back on the bus to New York. And when she got there, it was, it was gone. It was pulling away. So she never saw her brother again, and she never became a citizen because she was afraid that she would be deported. And uh, 
did what she could to live a tiny, tiny life. And, you know, it's, it's not uncommon. It's interesting. My father's side of the family was different. They, my father's father was, make it through the slaughterhouses and make your way. And he got, he did work himself <laughs> through to a college education, which was unheard of. So got his own little business. And so, again, it was an individual kind of thing. And so the idea of education, and I was desperate to think big with others, to think with people, as one of my mentors says, to have friends to think with. In terms of class, the, for me, you know, to have a brain that works pretty well, but you don't know the soup in which that brain generally lives, that the culture has a particular soup for big heads. And if you've got one, you better have a mentor who can get you where you need to go. Uh, now, I worked at really what would be considered the bottom of the barrel jobs. I was working at a place that for a paper company. It was kind of a sweatshop. We would cut the signs for uh, small businesses, milk, 30 cents a quart or something like that. And it was a silkscreen place. and. I was in that odd position, which I think many people are, where they, they love ideas, they love thinking. They're not in settings or schools that, or families or cultures or communities that necessarily support, or social structures that support that kind of interest. And it's not considered natural. Sometimes you'll be trashed in your own community for having big words falling out of your lips a little too often. And it could be from your family, too, that thinks you're getting above yourself. And so the tracking I was thinking about, I thought, in schools, I tested. I didn't know what I was getting tested for, but you took these tests. they decide you'd be a good forest ranger or whatever. That was one of mine. So I got into classes that were considered, I don't know, what did they call them, advanced? or They had names for them at that time. And I have a, a twin sister. We wanted very clearly to not be in the same courses and the same classes. I was most distraught about it. <laughs> I wanted the individuation. And so they put me as the one who made the request in all these other kinds of classes that were not considered maybe college-related or something like that. And that was the most eye-opening thing ever. There had been lots of comparison comparisons and stuff, and I'd seen that. But I was put into classes that were considered for the less than, maybe the tech-oriented folks. And people were, were big heads like me. They, were in, they had interested in good questions, and I don't know, maybe some of their skill sets were not quite as strong, but they were treated like trash. And I watched how I was in the classes, and the teachers recognized I was nobody they'd seen before. And once they got the scoop, I was treated I was treated quite differently. Everything I said seemed to be right or almost right. Everything I wanted to share or contribute was welcome. There was no mockery. There was uh, a, a quiet kind of reverence. Now, I had never received that anywhere before, but seeing the distinction, you know, I'd have peers right next to me say something very similar and be mocked, dismissed. Oh, it was just, it was awful. And I say that awful sounds sort of, oh, it was so terrible, but I don't mean that. As a twin, there's a, a horizontal nature to the way you experience the world and the way others are treated. So, ooh, this, I'm feeling, I can feel this very intensely. To have someone, and so this happens with all the structures and the oppressive nature of structures in this culture and elsewhere. When you see somebody right next to you being treated like they're slime, when they are essentially, they might look exactly like you, exactly like you, as twins sometimes do. We don't, but, you know, so there's something about that that is shocking and upends realities. And a lot of people are protected from that. But a lot of folks encounter it in their family. Christine talking about, you know, my brother was treated this way and I was treated that way. And then you expand it to communities and cultures. And it's because you're in the wrong body. It looks to be like a female body, or it looks to be like a male body, or a short body, or a well-functioning body, or something. And so 
I find great dismay and unsettlement around that. And in terms of tracking, I feel like we are tracked if we're in female bodies, if we're in bodies uh, with certain kinds of variations. And in terms of class, you can get tracked by the way you speak, the way you hold yourself, the language you use, and also how you respond to cultural situations, the level of the norms that you do and don't present. So tracking was a great way. And I thought, wow, this is definitely a big picture word for how folks get tracked in general. And she and Christine, you did a great job of describing lots of ways of being tracked when you, because you were a single mother or because you were pregnant or because you were on benefits. She did a great job of describing that kind of humiliation, having done that once in my life. In this country, it's a dreadful thing to have to be treated. It sets up a crazy kind of internal defendedness. Yeah, it's bad, bad, bad. As someone who actually did food stamps once for a month, but so I'd, I'd lost a couple jobs, and I was in between jobs, and I was really desperate. The humiliation of being fired from a job, when you've had a job since you were 15, I felt a connection with Christine around that, and to have to go for some kind of assistance, the way that this culture designs that, it is a nightmare. It is it is designed to humiliate you. I thought, why do we have such an ugly version of support when we are paying in? And when I worked at unemployment and people were coming for their benefits, I could feel their sense of shame or embarrassment. Or It was lovely. Now, that's the thing, to be in a position, which she clearly is, as a, hi a history teacher and a librarian where she's opening doors and ideas to folks. When you can help people navigate some of those systems or ideas to understand where they've come from or why they're having to deal with things that they are, I think that's a gorgeous thing to be able to provide. When she talked about the luck of having walked into a welfare worker who somehow was taken by her, she said she really was kind of sour and a bit of a pill, but she noticed her determination to succeed beyond where she was. And that that was a revelation to have someone treat her with such support, even though she could tell with other people she was probably not a pleasant human. And I had colleagues who were, who were horrible to clients, as if they could not ever imagine being in their position. Or maybe they had been in their position and it was, they wanted to be as far away from it as they could. You know how they changed hospitals so that uh, they had birthing centers? And before that, it was chilly, cold, and horrible for women to go into a hospital and have a baby. I feel like it's the same thing with all social service programs. They should have comfortable, sweet, I don't know, it would not be a big deal to make them more civilized and more heartful. How do you think about class? Did you relate to Christine's story? Were you tracked in school, in work, in life? Are you Abenaki or have Abenaki ancestry? How is history personal for you? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page, send us a tweet at En Mass Podcast, or email us at enmassepodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E -S -S podcast. For the next episode, we will hear the story of Randy, a work leader for the City of Barrie's Water Department and president of his local union, Ask Me 1369. Randy has worked his way up from driving a mill truck to working for the City of Barrie. He has worked in both the Water Department and the Cemetery Department. The Cemetery Department covers Hope Cemetery in Barrie, which is home to some of Barrie's finest granite memorials. Carved by people like Donegal, and now, Gompo from Episodes 3 and 7. Through his work, he has encountered people of many ancestries, histories, and cultures. Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archive footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback and suggestions for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. 
If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to our performer, S.B. Sobel, and our storyteller, Christine Smith, for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain.